and welcome to another episode of Adaptive Adjustments. I'm your host, Antinica. For today's segment, we're going to be discussing Eric Erickson's stages of psychosocial development. And on set, we have with us none other than Dr. Samuel Shafi, Medical Chief of Staff of the St. Anne Psychiatric Hospital, Advocate for Mental Health, yeah, and a psychiatrist by profession for over 30 years. So right. today... We're going to be um, discussing the stages of psychosocial development, which basically deals with persons and how their belief system interacts with the expectations of society. So let's jump right in. Thank you for joining us, sir. You're welcome. Thanks for inviting me. Nice, nice. Okay, so today we just want to take a look at the different stages, mm -hmm. right? And we know that one psychosocial development has a lot to do with their behavior patterns, the way in which they interact with others, their belief systems, and so on. So we want to take a look at the different stages up until the fifth stage because we press for time mm -hmm. and we're going to come back in another episode and explore the following stages. Okay. So, you know, we want to start with the first stage, which sure. would be the stage of trust versus mistrust, mm -hmm. yeah, which deals with um, from birth to 18 months old, mm -hmm. yeah, and um, at that stage, you know, a lot of children, well, babies, basically, they are dependent on love and affection and nurturing from their parents. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, I just wanted to share a bit with the audience about that, how you think it, it influences one's growth, being nurtured the correct way, and you know, how they can transition from that stage into the upcoming stage. Okay, so if you look at Eric Erickson and the psychosocial development theory, um, although it's eight stages, the different stages focus at uh, different um, schemes in terms of scheme of things, mm -hmm. uh, looking at uh, competencies, looking at uh, crises that can happen, and then looking at interaction between the individual personality and the society at large. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that you must be aware of is that why each stage is quite important is that if you don't go through one stage in um, what is considered to be the right way, then the next stage can be very problematic. Yes. And uh, for each stage of er Eric Erickson, you have uh, outcome can, that can either be positive or negative. Yes, 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 yes. So what would you say are some of the positive outcomes of this stage of trust versus mistrust? Well, one of the things, if you look at it in terms of trust and mistrust, the, who does the child interact with or the, the infant? between the ages of 0 and 18. It's mainly the parents. Mm -hmm. So the interaction between parents and dependency on the parents and the parents' response to the child's needs at that point in time is what we de determine whether that the outcome is either positive or negative for the child. Uh, I'll give you an example. The common example is if, if the child is crying Okay. Um, how does a parent respond? Do they come? Do they nurture? Do they pay mm -hmm. attention to the child? Or do they just leave the child to cry? Yeah. Uh, I know there are different cultures in terms of how they look at it. In some cultures, they say, leave the child to cry, nothing will happen. Mm -hmm. But that can have its consequences because what can then happen is that the, what the child then achieves at that point will be more negative in terms of trust. So there will be mistrust. So I'm crying, you did not respond to my needs because crying is, at that age, is, one, is a way of communicating with the parents at that stage. So. Okay, so would you say that once the child encounters nurturing love and affection, that they are more confident in moving forward and trusting others as they progress in age? Correct. And right. it also paved the foundation for the next stage of development, psychosocial development. Okay, okay. Okay, so parents... You know, in some cases, the child, as, as the example was now raised, may be crying and some parents may believe that they need to leave the child to cry. And, you know, that can also have a negative effect on the child. So parents, they want to really nurture the child. They want to be there to give that child a sense of comfort for them to understand that you are there for them so that as they grow, they continue to trust others, you know, and they don't, they build their self-confidence and they build their relationship with others as they nurture as they mature, sorry. Yeah, so, you know, um, one of the aspects of growing up under trust versus mistrust, you know, um, the negative aspects of not being able to trust others. 
was a typical example that some would raise that, you know, um, sometimes the child would be crying, the parent wants mm -hmm. to leave, mm -hmm. and the child wants them to, wants them to go, wants them to stay, sorry, and, or they want to go with them. And the parent would say, you know, um, <laughs> go and get your slippers and come back, mm -hmm. you know, and you'll go with me. And as the child goes, you know, the parent goes as well. Mm -hmm. And when the child returns, thinking that they would be able to go with the parent, mm -hmm. you find that the parent is not there. How does that impact on the child? Well, so what you are then saying is basically getting to the next, probably the next stage where mm -hmm. you um, look at autonomy and in terms of the child's thinking that, okay, I'm capable of doing this, I'm capable of going with you, mm -hmm. and parents are still saying, no, you can't, and they lie in the process, mm -hmm. which can itself, in fact, don't forget also, because you have um, proper development from one stage in terms of achievement from one stage to the other, doesn't mean that what you achieved in the previous stage cannot be reversed, even though each stage is independent of each other. So I can trust you today, but you can do something tomorrow that make me to, to doubt you and not trust you again. How does that impact on the child's self-confidence though? Well, it does. At the end of the day, remember, even at the first stage and the second stages of psychosocial development, the primary interaction is still with the parents, not, the, not quite with the outside world. Hmm. So that is basically from 18 months to 3 years old. Correct. The child will be, they will be having a shift back and forth back. based on the different Well, occurrences. there's no back and, sh back and forth, but what we are saying is that, remember the, the what... Erickson is talking about each stage comes with its own crisis, apart from other demands in terms of competencies and things like that. And, and they are, although they are contagious in terms of you can't go to the next stage without passing the previous stage. Right. However, the gains you made in the previous stage you can lose in the current stage if okay. something goes wrong. Okay. So that's what I'm saying. All right. So um, at that stage as well, you know, it's autonomy mm -hmm. versus shame or doubt, mm -hmm. you know. And um, I would say that it's really practical for the parents to allow the child to make decisions, you know, um, simple decisions like choosing which color clothes they want to wear, Correct. Um, putting on your shoes, even potty training. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a positive, it helps with positive transition when the parents allow the child mm -hmm. to make that decision you know, mm -hmm. to move forward on their own so that they, be, they begin to feel that sense of independence mm -hmm. in their functioning, yeah? And even though, even as a parent, you disagree with them, you must do it in such a way that is very explanatory. You make them, probably explain to them the reason why you disagree with them. Mm -hmm. And don't think that they don't, they can't understand. They will understand if you put in a very simple language. Because the actions you take in terms of how we, you interact with them is, may not be the same every day. So the same child you said no today, tomorrow you may agree and say, come, come with me, let's go. So they will understand. So we're looking at over time. And that is why it's a, it's a specified period rather than just a point in time. So basically what you're saying is that the successful transition is going to encourage self-confidence within the child. Correct. And Correct. building that sense of independence. Correct. And understanding. Yeah in boundaries and so on. And negative, you find that they would be a bit more introverted. They would not want to trust others. They wouldn't want to really move forward. Correct. Yeah. Um, how does that impact the child later down, though? Um, because at the end of the day, you need positive energy in terms of being able to develop a strong ego. And so these interactions can be, um, what I would say, ego syntonic mm -hmm. or ego dystonic, whereby it's the, inter the negative interactions can, or the positive interactions can be very harmonious, the way that it actually boosts your self-confidence. Whereby, let's say the stage two, where your parents allow you to take chances, maybe put on your shoe, tie the lace, even though you're gonna make mistakes, they still encourage you to do things like that, will make you feel good about yourself. Unlike if they put you down and tell you, you can't do that, you can't do this. Oh, let me do it for you. Um, so the advice is that in situations that are to avoid situations where you actually bruise the child's ego, you make proper planning in terms of going forward. Let's say you, you know the child will need an additional five minutes to put on the laces. Maybe you need to put in 
additional prime minute to do your planning if you have to go out. That's okay. just an example. Okay, so basically, parents, what Dr. Shafi is saying is that based on the level of your restrictions, it's going to influence the child's feeling of autonomy, their independence, and build their self-confidence. So you don't want to put too much of restrictions on the child, right, as they grow. You want to give them the opportunity to explore and to engage in certain activities that would be, you know, conducive for their well-being in the future. Yeah? All right. Yeah, so that brings us to the third phase, mm -hmm. which would be from ages five yeah. onwards. That would be, um, I think, is autonomy. No, autonomy versus shame and doubt. This would be industry versus inferiority, yeah. Correct. And industry said means work. Mm -hmm. So if you see that phase, that phase is when they actually start like preschool. Right. Right. Um, or, or is this, yeah, preschool. And what tends to happen is when they start interacting with people beyond the mom and dad, the parents, and then realizing they can do things on their own, yes. realizing they are different from, I'm different, I'm now I realize I'm different from mom. They also interact with teachers and maybe other class, class members. So their social circle enlarges. Enlarges and they realize right. there are things they can do independently of their parents. Right, so then they start comparing themselves yeah. to other people. And then so they comment, the positive or negative comment from either the teachers, the parents, will then determine whether you feel good about yourself, superior, or you feel inferior mm. about yourself or whether you feel as if you're competent or not competent, which is a negative outcome of the comments and the, the, the way people interact with you. Hmm. So that is why we would find some children would be a bit, they keep to themselves, they, not, they, they would be perceived as shy, but really is that they're not given the opportunity from the previous stage to really engage in um, autonomous activities and so as they grow, when they enter primary school, you find that they start, they start to compare themselves to other children. Other children. Right. So, so they feel inferior. Right. They feel so inferior. that, that informs the third stage of development, where you feel inferior because um, you're comparing yourself to other people. Okay. So is it that the parents need to allow the children to be more in charge of situations throughout this stage of their development, give them like responsibilities within the home, nothing too strenuous, but like ideas where they can feel that sense of... Actually, what tends to happen most of the time is these children are the ones who actually will take the initiatives. Okay. It's the response of the teachers, the, the, the parents, the caregivers, as to those initiatives. They try things. It's what we do that then matters. Do we encourage them in the right direction or we discourage them in the wrong direction where we put them down? and tell them they can't do this. You should do, do that. Uh, I'll give you an example. I want to ride a bike. Um, I'm four, maybe five years old. Oh, oh, you fall down. Don't do that. Things like that. But a five-year-old want to take a risk. So they, they be risk takers. Um, so if I fall down and you come back and I say, didn't I tell you? I tell you, Denver ride a bike, you're going to fall down. Or you say, oh, don't worry, you'll be able to do it tomorrow. Which one? Which one goes, does better for the ego? The motivation. The, yeah, the yeah, positive the force yeah. of, of that interaction, which is a social interaction mm -hmm. that affects your personality at the end of the day. So if I give you a, a positive comment, then tomorrow you're, you're more likely to want to try it than if I give you a negative comment. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's a good point, you know, because sometimes we also find that children may be in school and they may not be excelling in certain areas, maybe sports or even academics. And you find that parents may really bring them down because of that. So throughout this stage, it's really important that the parents, they look and they find ways to encourage a child mm -hmm. in situations that may be, you know, um, useful for them, that they may be skilled at mm -hmm. and push them to that extent so mm -hmm. that they're able to, you know, uh, make the best of it and mm -hmm. build that confidence in themselves. Correct, correct. Yeah. That's really awesome, though. That's really awesome how the, each stage transitions into each other, mm -hmm. you know, and they all play a part because, as you rightfully said in the beginning, if a child does not transition through one stage... Properly. Properly. Mm -hmm. They're going to be That's problems consequences. later down. Consequences. Yeah. yeah um, Wow, so the successful transition equals feeling industrious, you know, building confidence in themselves, 
Whereas the negative aspect would be inferiority, inferiority, low self confidence, low self esteem, this, yeah. low self confidence. They become like a bit that. introverted. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. So you know, um, we're going into identity versus role confusion, and this is a really, really important stage. You know, this is the stage of teenagers mm -hmm. from um twelve onwards up until about age eighteen, and. It's, it's just as it says, identity versus role confusion. So at this stage, you find that the children are now exploring who they are. And I think that this stage plays an imperative role in who we are as adults. Correct. You know, um, a lot of teenagers, you find that they would have issues stating that they don't know who they are. You know, they, some of them, they believe that they're supposed to be another gender. Some of them feel as though they need to be an, a different body size, a different body weight, you know, and I think that it plays a, an integral part of how they transition throughout this stage. Okay. You know, um, could you tell us a bit about it? So what tends to happen at that age is that, you know, we talk about the stage one, to stage two, to three, where you have a lot of interaction between uh, the child and the parents, the child and the teacher and the peers in mm -hmm. the classroom. Mm -hmm. But during this period of um, identity and role confusion, they then realize that the world is more complex than the narrative that was provided by maybe this, the, the immediate family members, the teachers and the peer groups. So what then happens is that they, they peer away, they move away from peers, they move away from parents, to be able to properly evaluate who they are. So they ask a lot of questions. Who am I? What am I? What is my purpose? Yes. So a lot of them may then find themselves trying different things, alcohol, drugs. Um, they may talk about career choice. So they see a lot of things happening out there. But the outcome then depends on what direction they go and the consequences of the decisions they make at that point. So it's a very complex stage, which can impact on the overall development of the child. Hmm. How important would reinforcement and encouragement from the parents be throughout this phase? Well, at that point, they will still need guide, even though they are moving away from parents, because even though we think that at that point they are easily influenced by a peer group, but don't forget social media is even stronger now than peer group. Um, now in these days, maybe the time that Eric Erickson wrote that there was no social media. Now, social media is actually making it even more difficult for parents to have direct influence on their, on their children. But in terms of guide, uh, the best guide is example. Uh, in terms of what parents do at home, how they conduct themselves, the kind of communications they have, um, limiting domestic violence, abuse, and things like that, uh, allowing them to ask a lot of questions about whatsoever comes to their mind, not being judgmental. And so guiding them and being truthful tend to do a lot better in, than if you push them away. So if you reject what they are, the questions they put to you, you are basically even putting them in more trouble and more exposed to the elements out there, which is social media these days. Based on your experience, would you say that children um, to date mm. are transitioning smoothly through this stage? Or are no, I would say no, because in the time that that, um, that document was written, like I said, there was no social media. So transitioning these days is more complex than what it used to be, because the influence is wider. So the influence is not just mommy, daddy, classmates. So you can be in Trinidad and be influenced by somebody in Japan, in Australia, which never used to happen, or somebody in Hawaii. And they, they talk, they play games online. You play games with somebody you've never met. True. You, you chat with somebody you've never met. Mm -hmm. And they influence you, seriously, yeah. uh, in terms of what you do. And then, so, and that brings things like body image issues, um, I'm fat, I'm, I'm, I'm ugly, and things like that tend to, you know, feed yeah. into their psyche. Yeah. All right. Um, one, of the, one of the concerns that I would have is throughout this stage with children are like um, expectations, mm. right? A lot of them believe that they, okay, well, like some parents, they would give up the impression that as a teenager, you're supposed to know what you want to be, you know, um, in career-wise. Mm. And most times, like, 
the subjects that they choose in school at that point in time, and you think that you want to be a banker or you want to be a lawyer, that most times that doesn't really happen. You know, you would transition into a totally different career. And you find that a lot of youths, based on my experience working with some of them, what has happened is that based on the parental expectations, we have a lot of um, disturbances mentally taking place, such as um, anxiety, right, depression within the, within the home because of that. How do parents now ensure that children do not, you know, that they are exempted from these disorders then based on their expectations of them? It also depends on the stages that the parents may have gone through and the, the social norms, what is acceptable. Uh, it is always the expectation of parents that their, their children turn out in a particular way, which mm -hmm. is part of the social influence that mm -hmm. Eric Carrickson talked about. Uh, whereby you, you have a clash between the personality and social, social influences. And those demands that you talk about from the parents is part of the crisis, yeah. part of what even you deem the crisis uh, within the context of that, that stage of development. So that there's a crisis whereby I say, I don't want to be a doctor, but my parents are telling me, oh, I think it's better you be a doctor. That's part of the crisis. Yeah. So how I then navigate or survive that stage, either in agreement with my parents or opposing my parents, then it will determine how well I do in the next stage of mm -hmm. development. So parents should basically be a bit more understanding towards what their child would want to be, or is it that they should just go ahead and impose these, you know, because a lot of parents, they try to live vicariously through their child. And um, it doesn't really end well. You know, we have a lot of youths right now going for counseling and so on. Because of this, they, ha they are anxious when coming to exams. You know, they feel as though they are not um, excelling good enough at home because their sister would have done better or their brother would have done better. So what are some tips that you can give to parents? To help them. I think the, the, the best thing is to still allow the children to ask to ask questions as much as possible. And issues of career, uh, that discussion should start maybe as early as possible. Maybe form two, form three, you should start talking about career choice. And basically allow the children, most once they allow them to ask questions, and uh, guide them um, in the process in terms of choice. Now, some will still make the choice and probably regret it later. But it's still better than they make the choice rather than blame you for mm -hmm. their depression and anxiety and whatsoever they go through after you actually force them to go to, into a career they are not happy with. Uh, the an issue of anxiety and depression and things like that will come up when, if you talk about SEA, in mm -hmm. terms of the pressure that they have to go through just mm -hmm. to be able to get into the school of their choice, um, that might be part of the problem as well. Yeah. Okay. I know um, it ties, this topic ties into child rights as well mm -hmm. because the children have a right to be heard. They have a right to make choices mm -hmm. based on their association. Mm -hmm. They have a right to, you know, express views. They have a right to mass media mm -hmm. and all these things. But, you know, um, once, you, once you engage the child in participating in, in their welfare, you know, in... You don't just have like a big stick and say, well, this is what I want you to do and this is what you should do. Then I think it will help a lot in the transition, you know, going into the upcoming yeah, stage. Yeah, it's, it, that's easier said. Remember, they are, when we talk about this, remember Eric, Eric says psychosocial. So mm -hmm. there are two parts to it. You mm -hmm. have the psychology part of it, yeah, which is who social. you are. You have the social. And when you look at the social aspect, it's multidimensional things that influence that aspect, mm -hmm. religion, um, where you live, um, your social class, your race, th many things influence that. So that it's not easy to put that in a bubble and mm -hmm. say, okay, this is what will work for maybe everybody. Um, so it will then depends on individualizing the way parents, parents should be able to identify and know what works for each child. Some children will need support. They will need guidance. They will need help to be able to select a career. Whereas some other children will be more strong will, yeah. stronger ego, who mm -hmm. will prefer to make their own choice. So that is the way I look at it. 
Okay. Because the time of Ericsson, parents, children were more likely to just agree with parents, whatsoever <laughs> they say. Not now, because uh, there's all of, a lot of stuff influencing yeah. children these days. These days, they children are not voice. like children of uh, 50 years ago. Yeah, children now have a louder voice you yeah. know, in their decisions and, yeah. and their, their future. Yeah. yeah, so guys, that was a lot. We have the different stages of development, Eric Erickson's psychosocial developmental phases. So far, we covered five phases, which would be trust versus mistrust, initiative versus shame and doubt, doubt um, industry versus inferiority. Then we have um, isolation. I didn't. No, I we haven't reached isolation. No, we need no isolation is after identity. Mm, mm. Yeah, um, let me just double check here. Autonomy versus shame and doubt. Initiative versus guilt. Yes, initiative versus guilt, and then identity versus rule confusion. So upcoming, we have the isolation, which is where they deal intimacy, with relationships. Intimacy, like intimacy. isolation. Yeah. So, guys, these are some tips that your parents need to consider in raising your children. You know, um, you heard it from Dr. Shafi. Psychiatrist, medical chief of staff of the St. Anne Psychiatric Hospital and advocate for mental health and wellness. Yeah, so in our upcoming episode, we're going to explore the other stages that is going to take us all the way down to 65 plus, right? And I just want to thank you for being on our yeah, show. Welcome. Thank Thanks. you for giving us the time, you know, and enlightening us as to the different stages and how parents can transition with their child, you know, and encourage the child to build self confidence and so on in moving forward. Yeah, so I want to thank you, the listening audience, for being on board with us, right? I'm your host, Auntie Nika. See you on our next episode. Thank you. Mm -hmm.